but this victory is for the cricket cleansing of the cricket. Hello and welcome to episode 51 of Radio Cricket. That's 51, the same number of metaphors that Rami's Raja manages to butcher in each commentary stint. <laughs> Speaking to you live from the land down under, that is, underwater, I am Nishant Joshi, and I am joined as always by the only man to come out of the BCCI scandal squeaky clean, it is the Teflon man himself, James Marsh. Yes, indeed, Nishant. It's soggier than an English summer here, but uh, thankfully we're okay down in the south of the Czech Republic. But how are you getting on up there? Well, James, I'm as always, I guess, uh, as in life, I'm keeping my head just above water. <laughs> but I mean, last week, as I often do, I was shooting the shit on Twitter and I, I came up with some alternative interpretations for the acronym of BCCI. That is, of course, the Board for Control of Cricket in India. And the most popular interpretation turned out to be Bookies Control Cricket in India. And in an incident that would have registered pretty highly on Alanis Morissette's ironometer, this seemingly harmless, run-of-the-mill joquette somehow made its way to none other than Lalit Modi, who then tweeted his approval and now sports a logo as his Twitter display picture containing the same phrase, bookies control cricket in India. Now, James, as we all know, Lalit Modi likes to paint himself as a sort of martyr for Indian cricket. He does seem to view himself as a tragic cross somewhere between Gandhi and Joan of Arc, although the rest of the world views him somewhere along the lines of a blood-sucking leech and a cockroach that could survive the nuclear apocalypse. Now, Lalit Modi was also in the headlines this week for tweeting how important it is to get corrupt administrators out of the BCCI. This, of course, in spite of the fact that Lalit Modi is currently hiding in London after the BCCI probed him for, yup, you guessed it, James, charges of corruption. And, dear listeners, as the saying goes, you shouldn't laugh at tigers for being too stripy if you're wearing a zebra print dressing gown. <laughs> Well, quite nice. Well, I'm glad to see you finally firmed up the links between yourself and Lalit Modi. I think uh, people see you as very much the apprentice to his sorcerer. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, yes, of course, on that subject, Nishant, of course, we do have a new interim president of the BCCI because following an extraordinary meeting on Sunday, which had so many leaks it made the ECB's handling of the KP saga look discreet, the upshot was that N. Trinivasan has finally agreed to step aside, not quit, but step aside and allow Jagmohan Dalmir to take interim control. Dalmir is an interesting figure of course, he's a former president of both the ICC and the BCCI. He's a 73-year-old who himself has faced charges of financial irregularities in December 2006 when he was dismissed by the BCCI for misappropriation of funds allocated for the 1996 World Cup. However, we should say that he was subsequently exonerated, but still, Nishan, it's hard not to think that his appointment isn't so much a new broom sweeping through Indian cricket as someone emptying an old hoover bag all over its fans' heads. So, I don't know what your take is is on the latest developments at the BCCI. Does it fill you with optimism that the game is going to be squeaky clean pretty soon? Yes, James. Jagmohan Dalmia, the man who was accused of massive misappropriation of funds during his time as BCCI president, that's over $2 million that is still as of yet unaccounted for, has dutifully stepped up to temporarily replace the 67-year-old man with the face of an 87-year-old scrotum. That is our old friend, of course, and Srinivasan. And James, you can tell just how fucked up the situation is with the BCCI because they're making Pakistan look positively peaceful in comparison. This is Pakistan, a country that still has its national cricket stadium named after a brutal dictator, and they're being made to look like a Scandinavian utopia by the BCCI. And James, the ironic thing about BCCI politics is that everyone in the board seems to hold a grudge against someone else, and everyone seems prepared to stab the other in the back at the first sign of potential convenience. It's like a merry-go-round of political backstabbing, except that these decrepit, crusty old men will stab you in the back, then turn you around and shake your hand as if nothing ever happened. And James, the best example of this is in 2006, when Dalmia was actually expelled from the BCCI, and none other than Srinivasan himself actually voted for Dalmia's expulsion. At the time, Srinivasan was the BCCI's treasurer, we all know how much he loves money, and he himself said that Dalmia had brought the board into disrepute, 
also making note of his financial irregularities relating to the 1996 World Cup. And as we all know, Srinivasan is pretty well acquainted with these financial irregularities. And overall, James, it's, it's a political cluster. Just when we thought we were getting rid of Srinivasan, we got Dalmir. That's like being cured of chlamydia, then being diagnosed with incurable herpes. <laughs> well, indeed, Nishant, it does seem to be something of a lingering virus surrounding Indian cricket. And just talking of backstabbing and revenge, it's interesting to note, of course, that uh, Dalmir was at the heart of the Mike Dennis affair back in 2001, when the former England captain was the match referee in India's game against South Africa when he found six India players guilty of various offences, including Sachin Tendulkar, who was accused of ball tampering. Now, of course, Nishant, this went down about as happily as Michael Douglas probably does now. <laughs> and Dal was at the heart of the protests against the ICC. And as Wisden noted, it said, the tourists were mere bystanders while war was waged on their behalf by Dalmir. He had to take a stand, not that he needed much provocation to adopt a bellicose posture. He was presented with an ideal opportunity to settle scores with his old ICC adversaries. Now I think this goes back to the time in the late 1990s when having been ICC president, he was then eventually voted ICC head, but only after having been rejected a few times. So yes, as you say, Nisha, it does seem to be a historical labyrinthine mess of grievances and backstabbing which we're not likely to see the end of anytime soon. And now to matters on the field and we have the Champions Trophy kicking off this week. It's the top eight teams in the world, a streamlined competition, 15 games in 17 days so perhaps a little bit of an antidote to the IPL and Nishan it is being held in England for the first time since 2004 when we had a slightly farcical tournament which had 12 sides in it including the USA and Kenya which while I would never wish to deprive anyone the chance of watching Stephen Tickelo bat meant the whole thing was more bloated than a foie gras goose and almost as expensive for spectators many of whom were denied entry to matches because because they tried to take in Cola, which wasn't the official sponsor. It made the IPO look like a celebration of common sense, Nishan. Looking ahead to this latest tournament, this week, Nishan, you've got what might be described as a fairly passionate response after you made a few comments on Twitter about the capabilities or otherwise of the present India squad. So just what's your take on how you think they're going to go in this tournament following on from all the well, scandal back I home? I mean, in, in my opinion, I think there are a few teams who are, who are quite vulnerable to suffering an IPL sort of hangover uh, this Champions Trophy because... I mean, it's still only two weeks. It will be two weeks since the IPL ended, lest we forget, of course. And, of course, all of these Indian players were involved in the IPL to some extent. And, I mean, if you look at the, the games, the way that they played during the IPL, it was kind of swashbuckling, sort of reckless cricket that most of them played. And, I mean, I just can't see India having a particularly successful tournament just because I think the transition is going to be really difficult from them. I think it's going to be a bit like from jumping from a sauna into an ice bath here. And especially with these fabled English conditions, I think once they hit pitch, which will is maybe slightly alien to subcontinent conditions, I think that India will really struggle. And if you think about it, it's India's weakest squad for an international tournament in a very long time. If we ignore the, the T20 stuff and, and focus on, on the ODIs, then... This is India's first tournament in a very long time without players like Virendra Sehwag, Gambhir, Tendulkar, of course, uh, and Zahir Khan and Harbhajan Singh, uh, and Yuraj as well. And instead, they've got a very lightweight squad. They've, Especially their bowling really concerns me. I mean, if you look at the bowling, it's very inexperienced and very fragile, in my opinion. You've got bowlers like Umesh Yadav, uh, Vinay Kumar, Ishant Sharma, Irfan Patan, uh, Bhuvaneshwar Kumar, who, of course, is highly rated but still very inexperienced. So you've not really got a spearhead for that attack. And you've got a lot of bowlers who can go for miles at death, and I think they're really going to 
find it very difficult in English conditions. But James, what do you think about the movers and shakers in, in this year's <laughs> Champions Trophy? Well, I presume you're talking about Dwayne Bravo there, Nishan. <laughs> but uh, anyway, in terms of favourites, I see England are still being touted as joint favourites with South Africa by some bookies, despite their rather underwhelming performances against New Zealand, which saw Martin Guptill score those two wonderful unbeaten centuries, the second of which was the fifth highest ever ODI score in history. I suppose the only thing England can take out of those matches is that Dernbach himself isn't actually in the Champions Trophy squad. But nevertheless, it still looks like after a period of apparently quite diligent and intricate planning, and even the 3-2 defeat in India wasn't without a few high points, it looks as if England are going into this tournament looking a bit shabby and unfocused. So I'm going to have to dismiss my home nation, I think. Moving on to South Africa. Of course, they're without Graham Smith and Jack Callis. And they go into it with a couple of questions over their bowling attack. Morkel had a, had a very, very ineffective IPL. And we've heard the news that Dale Stain is possibly going to be injured for the start of the tournament. So that's obviously going to be a, a worry for them. On the plus side, they've also got JP Dumini coming back after he sustained a very nasty injury in a warm down some time ago, which went into the Clem McGrath school of unlucky injuries. Also another player I will be looking at is McLaren, who's a gangling but nevertheless quite elegant, I think, batting all-rounder, who's also capable of improvisation when required. He hit a superb scoopy six off the last ball of the third ODI against New Zealand back in January. And he's certainly got balls in these sort of chases. So, Nishan, they're two players which I'll be keeping an eye out. But what's your take on South Africa's chances overall? The talk has been about missing Smith and missing Callis. But overall, I mean, if you if you look at Callis, he hasn't even played an ODI in, in over a year. So, South Africa have been kind of pre-planning for his his departure for quite a while and even Graham Smith I don't think that his absence will be too badly felt so long as Alvira Peterson at the top of the order can have a reasonable tournament I wouldn't worry too much about the loss of Graham Smith but I mean it's their middle order which really stands out to me if they fire then you've got players like A.B. de Villiers, J.P. Dumini and, and David Miller as well. And I, th I think that if maybe one or maybe even both or, of uh, Dumini and Miller have really decent tournaments where they're averaging 50 plus, and I think Dumini, he really looks to me, that having seen him in the last couple of innings, albeit against the Netherlands and in a warm-up against Pakistan, he really looks like he's returned from injury with a, with a bit of a running start here. And I think that I really have high hopes for Dumini. And going towards the bowling, on paper, you've, you would look at an attack of someone like Stain, Morkel, Sotsobi. I mean, Sotsobi and Morkel had two of the top 10 strike rates in ODI history. And of course, Dale Stain goes without saying, one of the most threatening bowlers in the world right now. And for me, I, I'd say Ryan McLaren has really kind of matured in the past maybe a year or so. In the absence of Jack Carlos, they've been playing him quite a lot, trying to fill the void of the all-rounder. And Whereas he started off as a bit of a, maybe a Tim Bresnan sort of bat a bit, bowl a bit sort of all-rounder who, who wasn't really good enough to get into the side for either. Now he really seems to have, have grown and taken on that role. But the one man, I would say, really kind of the silent sort of glue in this South African side over the past couple of years has been Robin Peterson. He's a, he's a guy who's really flown under the radar and... He's a type of player who, who received a lot of criticism for being a tremendously average, mediocre cricketer. And to be honest, I, I really did feel that way up until around the 2011 World Cup. And that was the sort of turning point in Robin Peterson's career. Up until that point, he averaged over 50 with the ball in ODIs and just about 14 with the bat. And since then, he's been really exceptional for South Africa without receiving any sort of attention or credit. He hasn't won matches single-handedly, but he's really put in decent shifts for them. He's taken important wickets and he's not really gone for any runs. Since the 2011 World Cup, he's averaged under 30 with the ball. And that's exactly what you want from your spinner. As, as well, of course, he can, he can hit decent runs at eight, number eight or nine in the batting order and I really think that South Africa do stand a good chance so long as they can get off to a decent start and so long as that dreaded C word doesn't come into the equation.
And moving on to the side who actually beat South Africa in a warm-up game at the weekend, and that's Pakistan. And I think they boast one of the most exciting young prospects in the tournament, Junaid Khan, although I suppose we mustn't get too excited about young Pakistani left-arm quicks. We've all been hurt before. But anyway, I think he's an absolutely wonderful prospect. If you look at his figures for the last 12 months, he's taken 27 wickets in ODIs, uh, an average of 19.62. In that warm-up game I mentioned, he knocked Hashim Amla, of all people, over for a second ball duck with an absolutely superb in-swinging delivery, and he almost achieved the unthinkable of making Hashim look a little bit awkward. Not quite, but almost. Incredibly, he was excluded from Pakistan's World T20 squad last year, which at the time seemed like one of the most bizarre omissions since Samit Patel forgot to pack a Mars bar. Looking at the batting, they've got Australia's Trent Woodhill there as coach for the duration of the Champions Trophy, so They'll be hoping that he can add just a little bit of solidity to that lineup. So, Nishan, I must admit, I've got high hopes for this Pakistan team. What are your thoughts on their prospects in the tournament? Well, yes, James, I really do think that Pakistan stand an excellent chance. I think that their, their bowling, as you mentioned, is, is always a strong point. And along with Australia, I think it's the strongest in the tournament. I mean, if you look at Pakistan's bowling lineup, Junaid Khan, Wahab Riaz, Mohammed Irfan, Asad Ali, Esan Adil. You've got two really decent pack up paces there. And of course, you've got the really decent spin trio of Mohammed Hafiz, Abdul Rahman, and Said Ajmal. It doesn't even look like Said Ajmal will make the starting lineup as it stands for Pakistan, such is the form of Abdul Rahman. And really, I think that Pakistan do often get a lot of criticism, justified, of course for their brittle batting, but the statistics will tell you that Pakistan have been surprisingly consistent in these ICC tournaments, uh, having reached six consecutive ICC semi-finals in a row. It is, of course, the the batting ability to score big runs under pressure, which will always remain a bit of a question mark. But, I mean, on these English pitches, in early season conditions, if the bowling lineups can consistently dismiss sides for around 200, then you'd have to say Pakistan stand an excellent, excellent chance of going deep in this tournament and maybe even winning it. Of course, it is their the batting which remains an enigma as always. I mean, you've got someone like Kamran Akmal that Pakistan might actually come down to relying on at some point, which is a scenario which I'm sure Pakistan's fans won't exactly relish. Indeed not. And you mentioned Australia there, Nishant. They're perhaps somewhat unfancied at the moment, coming off the back of their rather disappointing tour of India. But if you look at their ODI stats for this year, they've won their last six matches, including that 5-0 walloping of the West Indies, which probably went some way to the removal of Darren Sammy as Windies captain to be replaced by Dwayne Bravo so I I notice not many people are talking about Australia at the moment but they've got a very dangerous Yorker bowler in Mitchell Stark so Nishan do you think people have been a little bit lax in not fancying Australia for this tournament? Yeah, James, to be honest, I'm, I'm quite surprised to see that Australia have pretty much flown under the radar for this tournament because Overall, in on form, they've got they've got some of the best players equipped for this these sorts of conditions. I mean, most of their players do have uh, reasonable experience of English conditions, and I mean, for me, as I said, the the bowling lineup just behind Pakistan's, in terms of pace, you won't find much better than Mitchell Stark, Mitchell Johnson, and James Faulkner. You've got an all left arm pace trio, and you'd probably expect one of Mitchell Johnson or James Faulkner to maybe sit out in in favour of the right armour, Clint Mackay, who's, of course, also very, very underrated bowler. But for me, the standout player for Australia at the moment, Mitchell Stark, I think he's he's a very underrated bowler, even though he's sort of taken the world by storm. Again, this West Indies, he had a phenomenal series. In his short ODI career so far, he averages under 20 with the ball. And I think that after players like Lasith Malinga, Umar Gul in the last 12 months. It's been a time when we've really been championing bowlers bowling Yorkers and just saying, why don't you bowl Yorkers? Why don't you just pitch it up? You will get wickets at the death. And Mitchell Stark has been really the only other bowler apart from Gul and Malinga to actually be a consistent exponent of this. And every side that he's bowled to in ODIs over the past year, he's really caused a lot of troubles. And... I think that he's he could well be the bowler of the tournament for me. 
Well, that brings us to the end of another episode of Radio Cricket. Thank you very much once again for joining us. Of course, do be sure to subscribe to us on soundcloud.com forward slash radio cricket. You can also catch us on iTunes. Just search for Radio Cricket and you'll get us in your inbox every Tuesday. And just a... Just before we sign off, I want to leave you with the news that Jagmohan Dalmia, in his first act as acting IPL president, wants to get rid of IPL cheerleaders. Now, James, as I'm sure you know, we're quite a big fan of IPL cheerleaders, what, of course, with our long history of association, our, our, our proud history of associating with IPL cheerleaders. And of course, many IPL cheerleaders seem to have migrated from our home country of Czech Republic over to Chennai. So I would ask you one thing, Mr. Dalmia, you can take our money, you can take our freedom, you can take our Pepsi, but you cannot take our IPL cheerleaders. So until <laughs> next week, from me, Nishant Joshi, it's goodbye. And for me, James Marsh, just following on from Nishant's romantic ode in defence of IPL cheerleaders, I'd like to finish <laughs> with a, a quote from West Indian batsman Darren Bravo, who this week tweeted, A guy and a girl can be friends, but sooner or later one will fall for the other. Maybe too early, maybe too late, but maybe... Maybe forever. <laughs> Goodbye. I think it was a very poor performance. One of the worst things I have ever seen done on a cricket field. Good night. <laughs>